Hello! Have you been lucky enough to see the Northern Lights lately? We have seen an increased number of aurora recently. I'm going to be finding out why by talking to one of our space experts coming up. Thank you very much for joining me for your latest Met Office deep dive. As always, we do these every Tuesday. I'm Alex Burkill, a meteorologist and presenter here at the Met Office, and I'm coming to you from our headquarters in Exeter. As always, if you enjoy anything that I'll be talking about today, particularly the space weather aspect, then do make sure you hit the like button, share it with anyone who you think may be interested Interested, and also leave a comment. I will be looking at the comments later on and answering any questions that do pop up. But before we get on to the space weather aspect of today's deep dive, I'm going to run through the weather that we can expect through the next week in the run up to Easter and through Easter weekend itself. So starting off, let's look at the bigger picture across the UK. And at the moment, there's a, a tangle of fronts, which is why the unsettled, rather wet theme that we've had through recent weeks, through recent months, is going to continue for a while. But to understand why that is going to continue through the next few days at least, let's look across the other side of the Atlantic. And here we actually have quite a sharp thermal gradient. So cold air to the north, something much milder towards the south. And it's this thermal gradient that is then driving a pretty active jet stream. That jet is then dipping down. It's a south shifted jet. And that then plays a part on the weather that we're going to get across the UK. Because of the position of this active jet stream dipping to the south of the UK, we get stuck with a pattern across us. Now, often we talk about blocking highs and that could lead to lots of fine settled weather. It's pretty much the opposite this time round. We get stuck with low pressure across us. I'll get rid of the jet and put rain on instead. And as a result, we have a lot of uh, blustery, showery, and at times pretty wet weather to come as we go through this week. I will look at that in a bit more detail, but before I dart on, I just want to highlight the fact that because of the jet stream, plowing its way across Iberia, it is going to bring some pretty unsettled weather to Spain and to Portugal as we go through this week. I'll come on to that in a second. But back to the UK then, as we go through the next well few days. And we've seen some rain pushing its way up from the south as we've gone through today. Remember, this was recorded on Tuesday. And it is then going to continue its way northwards as we go through overnight into Wednesday. Across England and Wales, the rain's actually moving relatively quickly. But across Northern Ireland, it lingers for that little while longer. Then overnight, that rain bashes into something a little bit colder, uh, some colder air we have across Scotland at the moment. And so that's why we are going to see a bit of hill snow mixed in with that persistent rain. So a pretty wet picture across parts of Scotland as we go through the early hours of Wednesday morning. Behind it then, yes, some clearer skies, something drier for a time before a band of heavier, perhaps even thundery rain pushes its way in from the west southwest. Now again, that makes its way quite quickly north and eastwards across England and Wales. Yes, it will be heavy, some intense downpours, could be some hail mixed in, but it's across Northern Ireland where we may see it lingering again for that little bit longer. As a result, we do have a rain warning issued for Northern Ireland at time of recording. It's valid just for eastern parts, and that's because some places could see 50 millimetres or so uh, over the highest ground we're talking, but nonetheless, some impacts are likely as we go through Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning. Otherwise, and looking further ahead, and as we go through Thursday, we have an, a, a system coming across us. I'll actually, to show you that, look at the bigger picture first of all. So I'll get rid of the jet, let's put our rain back on and dart ahead to Thursday. And we have an area of low pressure that's coming towards us, and it's going to, well, it's, it's never been too far away. We've always been under the influence of low pressure, but as we go through Thursday, a rel it's going to be relatively deep and it's going to bring some pretty unsettled weather to parts of the UK. Pretty much the south. I'll look at the details in a second. I've highlighted this because I mentioned earlier that Spain, Portugal will have some unsettled weather this week, some heavy rain, some strong winds. And that is the case, particularly as we go through the next few hours or so, or few days, sorry, particularly tomorrow as we go through Wednesday. That's where they're likely to see some very hazardous weather if I just dart back. And all of this is in association with this low pressure that then comes towards the UK and crosses us northeastwards as we go through Thursday. So this feature has actually been named Storm Nelson by the Spanish Met Service. Now it is going to bring some unsettled weather to the UK, some strong winds, some heavy rain, nothing that really warrants us naming it. So it hasn't been named by us, 
but it's been named by the Spanish Met Service because it's bringing them some pretty unsettled weather. But that's happening a little bit earlier. So they're really seeing the worst of the wind and the rain as we go through uh, tomorrow, so Wednesday. But it doesn't exactly ease entirely. It stays very unsettled for them as we go through the next few days. Back to the UK, though. And as we go through Thursday, like I said, we are going to see some heavy rain and some strong, just a dart back, sorry, here we go, some heavy rain and strong winds piling up from the south. And I want to show you just how windy it's likely to get. So if we look at our wind gusts, and if we dart ahead to Thursday, so if we're looking at Thursday and Friday now, and if I pick somewhere towards the south coast, and there is the potential that we could see gusts in excess of 60 miles per hour as we go through later Thursday, Thursday afternoon. The winds do ease a little bit, but generally a blustery theme as we head into Good Friday as well. But yeah, it's across southern parts. If I just pick somewhere else and go a few other areas, you can see particularly the south and even the southwest. I mean, I think that's highlighting. Oh, I've gone over the coast, so ignore that. Um, but over the land, yeah, gusts of around 60 miles per hour are quite possible in exposed spots as we go through Thursday. Further north, if I just pick somewhere random towards like the borders area, yes, there'll be a breeze around, could be a bit blustery, but it's not going to be as windy or as impactful as further south. But darting on then, and as we go through the end of the week and towards Friday, and there is still some showery rain around on Friday. There could be something more persistent pushing into the southeast later Friday as we go into Saturday. But I think as we go through Good Friday and as we go through the Easter weekend as a whole, there's going to be a drying theme to things. So the showers will be easing, they'll be coming less intense, less thundery compared to earlier on in the week. And in fact, as we go towards Saturday, even more so, we're likely to see a drier theme. Not completely dry, I'm afraid. Most of us are a bit fed up with the rain. Not all of us, before you leave any comments saying you like the rain. Not everyone, but a lot of us are a bit fed up with it. And uh, so we were hoping for a completely dry weekend. That's not going to happen, but it is going to turn drier as we go through the weekend. And I think at least to start Easter Sunday, it's going to be mostly dry for many of us. Easter Sunday definitely looks like the driest day of the long weekend for many of us. Notice though there's some pretty unsettled weather towards the south of the UK. I'll come on to that in a second. The other thing that I wanted to show you about the uh, weather at the moment is the fact that it's a little chilly at the moment across northern parts. Uh, these are our maximum temperatures. I think I've picked somewhere over the highlands to get such a low maximum temperature for uh, Wednesday. But yeah, temperatures, maximum temperatures in Scotland are low single figures as we go through Tuesday and Wednesday. But they do pick up quite markedly as we go through the end of the week. And so by Easter day, Easter Sunday, it looks like we'll be getting back into double figures. So temperatures close to average, if not a bit above for the time of year. There's a similar trend if we look further south. I've just picked somewhere towards Berkshire, I suppose, uh, and this is showing that well, temperatures are near normal, perhaps a little bit below, but they are creeping up as we go towards Easter day. So yes, there's likely to be a slightly drier spell blip, perhaps in our weather for a time as we go through Easter day, and with that we're going to see something warmer too, but it doesn't last. If we look ahead to the following week, and this is the pressure anomaly map from ECMWF for the whole of next week, so from Monday the 1st to Monday the 8th of April. And it shows that the bluey greens show where lower than average pressure is more likely, so across the southern part of the UK. And this suggests that we are going to get some unsettled weather coming in from the southwest, low pressure dominating, so bringing more wet weather, more strong winds. And so it is going to be the return of the more unsettled conditions we've become somewhat used to. However, further north, there are hints that we could see higher than average pressure here and that would suggest that it could be a little bit drier. With that too, also a little bit cooler too, not as uh, cold as earlier on in the year for example, but it is likely to be a little bit cooler across northern parts compared to further south as a whole. This is looking at the whole week and so worth bearing in mind even though I'm suggesting northern parts, particularly northern Scotland, likely to be a bit drier and cooler, it won't always be that way. There will be some wetter and perhaps milder spells mixed in. But generally for the rest of the UK, it is looking pretty unsettled as we go through next week. 
In terms of how confident we are, and I wanted to show you this chart, if you've not seen it before, it's our forecast confidence index. And we go ahead in time, and obviously, as you would expect, confidence generally does drop as we go further ahead in time. But the greens show where confidence is higher than average for uh, that stage, that lead time. And you can see a big chunk of the forecast confidence is higher than average at the moment. At the moment, through the rest of this week, it's pretty much as high as it gets. So I am pretty confident that we are going to see some unsettled weather as we go through the rest of this week, starting to ease and turn a little bit drier for a short period of time as we go through the Easter weekend, before then relatively good agreement in the idea that we're going to see the unsettled weather returning. So that's everything that I want to say about the UK weather through the next week or so. One other thing that I did want to point out that I forgot to mention earlier, I talked about the storm uh, affecting Spain, Portugal, around Iberia. There is also a severe tropical storm, uh, Germain, which is affecting Madagascar at the moment. So if I just go try and find Madagascar. And this is causing a lot of problems. It's mainly affecting northeastern Madagascar, and it's going to continue to do so for quite a while. As we go through this week, it could bring sustained winds in excess or around 100 miles per hour and some very heavy rain. Worth bearing in mind, it really doesn't go anywhere particularly fast. It's going to continue to batter northern Madagascar as we go through much of this week, not really clearing away and easing until we head towards the weekend. So that is likely to cause some impacts there. But I think that's enough uh, for the weather that's going on at the moment and through this week. The thing that I teased at the start is space weather. So now I'd like to welcome Krista Hammond, who is a space weather expert here at the Met Office. And she is going to talk to us about some things that we've been seeing recently. Now, I have talked in the deep dives before and so have Alex Aiden and Annie about the auroras because we have seen quite a few auroras even spotted across the UK recently, more than we often do and more than we have done um, over recent years. So Krista, you're an expert in this. First of all, what exactly causes an aurora? How does it happen? What's going on with the sun that leads to it? All right, so to understand what's causing the aurora, we have to look at activity on the sun. And specifically, we're looking, we've got the Met Office Space Weather Operations Center here at the Met Office, and they're monitoring the sun 24 seven for signs of activity. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, first off, let's have a look at sunspots. Now these we can view in satellite imagery and they appear darker than the surrounding sun. Um, just to give you a sense of scale as well, by the way, um, this is obviously the sun. The Earth, the size of the Earth in comparison to one of these sunspots is around about the size of one of those tiny little black dots that you can barely see there. So just, so yeah, around about the there. Earth is just that little, little tiny dot there. relatively. It's not actually that dot, that's a sunspot. But wow, so the sun so is we're talking so about much bigger. That's right, and the sunspot regions are enormous. And what they are showing is areas of complex magnetic field. So when we're looking at the sun, we see the sunspots as dark because they're darker than the surrounding sun. But what they're actually showing showing is where the sun's magnetic field is really quite tightly wrapped, tightly, tightly packed. And that means there can be quite a lot of energy which is wrapped up in that magnetic field. So that's what we're monitoring. And what we can see when that energy is released is what we call a solar flare. Um, just before you go, oh yeah. so just to clarify, the sunspots are where it's, it's showing up darker and that's because it's Cooler? Yep, cooler than the surrounding sun. Still thousands of degrees Kelvin. So not so cold. Very hot, certainly not cold, but cooler than the surrounding and sun. And that's why it's high, showing up as a dot. And that's caused by the magnetic... The magnetic field in that area. So the sun's got a magnetic field and where the magnetic lines are very tightly wrapped, there's a lot of energy in there. It's cooler than the surrounding sun, which is why we view it as dark. So that energy, doesn't necessarily just stay wrapped up in the magnetic field, sometimes it's released and we can see these as what's known as a solar flare. And um, these images of the sun, they're all in different colours, they're looking at the sun in different wavelengths and by doing that we can see different features and we can see the activity like really nice and clearly. That there's flash there, off, there's there? one kicking off there. So this was just from a couple of days ago, this was on um, sort of the um, so sort of over is. the weekend, there we go, we saw a couple of solar flares from some of the sunspot regions which we were viewing on the sun. So these are, we view them as these bright flashes of light. These are eruptions of energy across the electromagnetic spectrum. And then, so we have a solar flare, and then what happens to that? 
So the solar flare, the energy from that is traveling at the speed of light. So the solar flare, the impacts are felt on Earth around about nine minutes after they occur on the sun. So it takes nine, nine minutes from when the solar flare happens on the surface of the sun for the flare to reach the UK. That's right. But yep. that's not when we start to see the aurora, is it? That's not. So those are solar flares and they can impact on the Earth's ionosphere, which is an area high up in the Earth's atmosphere where the area, it's an area which is charged. So this can cause disruptions to things like high frequency communications, but does not cause the aurora. For the aurora, we have to look at what can follow on from a solar flare, which is what we know as a coronal mass ejection. Before you go on, mm -hmm. you say the solar flare can impact high frequency communications. Can yeah. you tell us a bit more about what you mean? Links of, say, the aviation industry, for example, will use, radio will use high frequency radio communications to communicate beyond the horizon. So if you're in a plane which is on a transatlantic flight, for example, uh, the crew are communicating with air traffic controllers using high frequency communications. This is where a signal is sent, it bounces off the air of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, and is then picked up by the sort of receiver, which would be the aircraft or the air traffic controller. So what solar flares can do is they can disrupt that layer of the ionosphere, which means that that signal can either get absorbed or scattered, so it isn't picked up by the receiver. So we can lose radio communications during a solar flare. So it impacts those who rely on these type of things, such as pilots. That's right, yeah. They have yeah. other methods, so they can they, still land. They do, and they'll also have like contingency measures in place because it's not just space weather, which can mean that they can lose the HF comms. They could have just sort of system problems or things like this. So they, are, they do have contingency measures in place, such as just carrying on the same flight path until they're able to sort of communicate again with, their, with the ground, with their traffic controllers. Great. Sorry, I interrupted. Go on, no, no, so very, how very do we important. then get the aurora? I understand it to a certain level, but you've got this understanding way deeper than I have. <laughs> so what we're looking at, so the solar flares themselves are not what causes the aurora. What we're looking for, for beyond that is what's known as a coronal mass ejection. And this a is CME. A CME, much easier to say. And this is what we saw at the weekend as well. We had that solar flare. Our forecasters were on the lookout for what was coming, coming after that. And this is what we see in um, satellite imagery. This is, as the name suggests, an eruption of mass from the outer layer of the sun, the corona. This is showing billions of tons of plasma getting released into space. Plasma being charged particles, ions. So this is what we view in satellite imagery. To understand then how we get the aurora following on from this, we need to understand the interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. When that CME is sent into space, if it is directed towards the Earth, that charged mass can interact with the Earth's magnetic field. And it's these disturbances that we can see as the aurora. The energy, which is magnetically charged, is sort of follows the Earth's magnetic field lines up towards the poles. And it's this extra energy as it interacts with particles in the upper atmosphere, releases, you know, interacts with those particles, that energy is released as light, and that's what we see as the aurora. But if we have a solar flare, a CME, it doesn't always lead to an aurora in the, like being visible anywhere on Earth, does it? Why yeah, that? that's right. So it's down to like the size of the CME, for example. So um, we're looking for like the larger CMEs with more plasma. What is critical is the magnetic orientation of the plasma. So the Earth has a magnetic field, like a, like a bar magnet, you know, mm -hmm. positive on one side, negative on the other. Sure. This bubble of plasma as it leaves the sun, it has embedded within it a similar magnetic field. The thing is, we don't know what way that is. Is it north that's up or is it south that's up? And we also don't, we don't know that until it reaches a sensor on a satellite very close to Earth. And it's kind of critical for knowing the magnitude of the storming that we're then going to get here on Earth. Because similar, going back to bar magnets, opposites attract. So if it's oriented the same way as the Earth's magnetic field, much of the energy is repelled around the Earth's magnetic field. If it's the opposite way to the Earth's magnetic field, that energy is absorbed, which is what we're seeing here. And that energy is then transferred towards the poles. The more energy that there is, the more vivid the aurora is, but also the stronger what we know is geomagnetic storming is here on the Earth as well. So the greater impacts, other, aside from seeing the northern lights and seeing the aurora, the other impacts that we might That's get right. from 
the influence of the sun. And just to check, so it takes about nine minutes for a solar flare to reach the Earth, but yeah. it takes much longer for the CME. Yeah, these are traveling. These travel incredibly quickly, but they've also got a very long way to go. They've got 93 million miles to travel to get from the sun to the Earth. So they are traveling very fast. You know, they can be traveling at thousands of meters per second. Those are the sort of magnitudes we're talking. But the fastest CMEs will take around about 16 hours to arrive at the Earth. The slower ones can take several days. So that's why we see the solar flare. So the space weather uh, forecasters that we have here at the Met Office, they see the solar flare that comes towards us and that gives us a little bit of lead time to know that an aurora is more likely. But until it gets much close, till the CME gets closer to the Earth, to that satellite that's not too far away, yeah. will we actually know whether it's the right uh, mag magnetic charge to actually lead to an aurora? That's right. We can use the speed of the CME and we can use the size of it and whether we can also model them so we can um, establish whether it's going to be a direct hit or whether much of the mass is going to miss the Earth and go into space. So we can have an idea if we see a fast moving, what we know as a halo CME, which is what we actually saw at the weekend, where we see the plasma coming out as a halo, then we can get an idea that that is going to be a hit on the Earth mm -hmm. and we can model that, get an idea of the arrival time. So we know roughly that we, there's the potential for it to be a large geomagnetic storm when it arrives at the Earth. But whether it is orientated that way that it's going to have the highest impacts, we don't know until it's probably about 20 minutes, half an hour away from the Earth. Wow, that's uh, amazing. But as I said at the start, we have seen more aurora even in the UK. Why is that happening? Yeah, that's right. So we're seeing an increase in the number of space weather events that we're getting. And to understand this, we need to consider that the sun has what's known as a solar cycle. Uh, if I open this chart here, what we, what we see is that the sun has a cycle of roughly 11 years, which goes from solar minimum to solar maximum and back to solar minimum again. Solar minimum is, categorized, is classified by when we have the fewest number of sunspots visible on the sun. Solar maximum is when we see the most number of sunspots and then back to solar minimum again. So that cycle from minimum through maximum back to minimum is around about 11 years. It's driven by the magnetic field of the sun. Again, the sun's magnetic field flips every 11 years and this is what drives the activity on the sun, drives the solar cycle. So in 2019, we came out of solar minimum and we've been heading towards solar maximum since then. So as we're seeing an increased number of sunspots, as we would expect as we go towards solar maximum, we're seeing an increase in the number of space weather events as well, which gives us more of a chance to see the aurora. And, but are we at solar maximum already? So we're close. And the tricky thing is you don't know you've been in solar maximum until you come back out the other side and you go back down to solar minimum again. Uh, the Space Weather Prediction Centre and states who do have got space weather forecasting capability, but similar to what we have here in Moswalk, um, they will put out a forecast at the start of a solar cycle, predicting when that is going to occur, which is quite a tricky thing to do. I mean, imagine trying to do an 11 year forecast. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite hard. And um, originally, the solar maximum is predicted to be next year in 2025. But what this graph showing here is where the prediction is in red. That was what was predicted at the start of the solar cycle. And what we're seeing in black and purple is what we've actually observed in terms of the sunspot numbers. So ahead of predictions. So only, only slightly, but Just a little. Well, I suppose is that about almost a year ahead? It's pretty much taking it sort of six months to a year ahead. So they've up, sent an updated forecast, which is predicting solar maximum to be essentially any time from now to the end of the year. OK, so we're reaching a peak in solar activity this year sometime. Yeah. But we've also seen a peak recently around the equinox. An interesting extra sort of element to when we're doing space weather forecasting is around about the equinox, so spring and autumn equinox, the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field compared to the orientation of the sun's magnetic field means that we just get a better connection with the solar wind. So when we have space weather events, when you have that better connection, if the, if the plasma is orientated the right way, then we can see a slight enhancement in what we would expect from the geomagnetic storms. Really, it's the size of the CME, the speed of it, 
the magnetic complexity, which is going to dictate just how strong a geomagnetic storm we're going to get. With the equinox, you can typically see a better connection. So, although it's not the be all and end all, we are entering or in a going towards solar maxima, and this is the best time of year for seeing it. So, this is about as good as it gets. That's both right. now and then perhaps maybe in uh, around the autumnal equinox as well. Yeah, that's it. You know, unfortunately, as we saw at the weekend, there's other elements at play, such as the weather is the big one. Cloud cover, you can't see the aurora. And if you have any light pollution, whether that's from cities or even a full moon, your chance of seeing the aurora is limited. But this is one of the best times to see it when it occurs. Fascinating. Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, Krista. Just to uh, point out that we do have a number of content on our YouTube channel about Aurora Northern Lights, including this video here, which is available. I will add a link to it in the captions or in the comments section of the this video. So if you are interested in watching this whole video with subtitles and a, a, another explainer, but thank you very much, Krista, for joining us. It's been really interesting. Now, the last thing that I wanted to leave us with today, uh, don't forget, it's not really weather related, but it seems to always fall to meteorologists and weather presenters to remind you the clocks do spring forward this weekend, Saturday night, Sunday morning. We will lose an hour of sleep, but the payoff is the fact that our evenings are going to start to get lighter. So it should hopefully feel a bit more spring-like, even though, as I said before, the weather is going to turn pretty unsettled. Otherwise, thanks again for joining me, especially if this is one of your first deep dives. Welcome along, and thank you also if you're a regular viewer. I do hope you enjoyed it. I do th hope you enjoyed the insight that we got from our space weather expert. Uh, do leave a comment. Any questions you'd like answering, I will try and get back to you. And as always, hit the share button, hit the like button. It really does help get our message across. That's it for me. Aidan's back here tomorrow with the 10-day trend. Otherwise, I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.